At the turn of the century, a small woman from Fort Wayne, Indiana, began her career in medicine. Throughout her long and very productive life, Alice Hamilton combined medical expertise with a very high degree of humanitarian idealism, as well as a capacity to effectively communicate her views. The result is that she left us a very important legacy, the field of occupational safety and health. Alice Hamilton was born in 1869. She was very idealistic, and her initial career choice as a youth was to become a missionary. But she later changed her mind. I chose medicine because as a doctor, I could go anywhere I pleased, to far-off lands or to city slums, and be quite sure that I could be of use anywhere. In 1892, Alice Hamilton entered the medical school at the University of Michigan. She also studied later at Munich, Leipzig, and also at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And in 1897, accepted a position teaching pathology at the Women's Medical College of Northwestern University. At the same time, she moved into Jane Addams' Hull House a settlement house in Chicago. This experience greatly affected Alice Hamilton. In trying to improve the conditions she saw in the neighborhood of Hull House, she established a well baby clinic and also began to campaign for legislation restricting child labor. She even investigated the cocaine trade in Chicago. It was my experience at Hull House that aroused my interest in industrial disease. Living in a working class quarter, coming in contact with laborers and their wives, I could not fail to hear tales of the dangers that working men faced, of cases of carbon monoxide poisoning in the great steel mills, of painters disabled by lead palsy, of pneumonia and rheumatism in the stockyards. Alice Hamilton was shocked by the stories she heard of outrageous working conditions and by the callous attitude of employers, especially toward immigrant laborers. I remember a foreman saying to me as we watched enamelers at work, they don't last long at it, four years at the most, I should say, then they quit and go home to the old country. To die, I asked. I suppose that is about the size of it, he answered. Many times in those early days I met with men who employed foreign-born labor because it was cheap and submissive and then washed their hands of all responsibilities for accidents and sickness in the plants. They deliberately chose such men because it meant a surplus of eager, undemanding labor. They wanted to have men whom they could deal with as if they were children. In 1908, the newly formed Illinois State Occupational Disease Commission asked Dr. Hamilton to investigate the lead manufacturing industries. She was elated at the challenge provided by this opportunity. It was pioneering work of an unknown field. No young doctor nowadays can hope for work as exciting and rewarding. Everything I discovered was new and most of it was really valuable. Dr. Hamilton began her work with the commission by interviewing the victims of lead poisoning who were identified from hospital records. And once inside the plants, she found alarming conditions. For example, at each step of the lead production process, workers were exposed to clouds of dust in the air without benefit of either personal protective gear or proper ventilation. Dr. Hamilton examined the workers, identified those who were clear-cut cases of lead poisoning, and traced each case to a specific process. After a year of investigation, Dr. Hamilton made her report to the commission, but she felt that it was still not enough. I was the only one who had seen the men working on the Scotch hearths in the smelters. 
emptying the bag house and flues, shoveling the white lead from the drying pans. How could I hope that a cold printed report would serve to do away with these pressing dangers? So, from the first, I made it a rule to try to bring before the responsible man at the top the dangers I had discovered in his plant, and to persuade him to take the simple steps which were needed. In 1910, the U.S. Commissioner of Labor, Charles O'Neill, asked Dr. Hamilton to conduct an industry-wide study of the lead trades for the federal government. She agreed. Again, she had to locate the plants and do the investigations herself. She still had no formal right of entry into factories, so she used whatever influence she could. Once she even received the help of the father of an acquaintance from prep school. Hamilton was often appalled by the vast number of accidents and deaths occurring in the workplace. In a particularly vivid letter to her mother, she described the scene from a Philadelphia hospital. As I sat by the window, I could watch the ambulances crawl up the hill to the accident entrance with a new victim inside. So many cases are sent from the mills that evidently the clerk got tired of writing the name of the company and had a rubber stamp made, which appropriately enough he uses with red ink. All down the page came these red blotches just like drops of blood. Dr. Hamilton also performed a study of munitions works for the federal government during World War I. Industrial medicine was becoming more respectable and Alice Hamilton was emerging as one of its leading figures. As more and more labor organizations begin to assert a right to safe and healthful working conditions, Dr. Hamilton accelerated her efforts. In 1917, the limestone cutters of Bedford, Indiana, demanded a federal investigation into the effects of the air hammer on the health of workers. Dr. Hamilton believed that the greatest danger was the dust created by cutting the huge slabs of stone. Thirty years later, she found that time had supported her theory and that the rate of pulmonary tuberculosis among stone workers had indeed risen drastically. In the fall of 1919, Dr. Hamilton received an invitation to join the faculty at the Harvard Medical School as an assistant professor of public health. My astonishment can be imagined, for Harvard was then, and still is, the stronghold of masculinity against the inroads of women. She accepted the position, but on her own terms, that she would have half of each academic year free, and that she would be allowed to continue her work with Hull House. Throughout her career at Harvard, she continued to work for many political and social causes that took her to meetings and speeches throughout the world. At the same time, she traveled throughout the United States, performing investigations of various industries. Her last detailed study came in 1937, when the federal government called upon her again to do an investigation of carbon disulfide in the viscose rayon industry. In the 1950s, Dr. Hamilton began to cut back on her activities. Although she wrote a substantial autobiography, she was very modest about her own contributions. For me, the satisfaction is that things are better now and that I had some part in it. Alice Hamilton died at her home in Hadlime, Connecticut in 1970 at the age of 101. Three months after her death, the United States Congress passed the Occupational Safety and Health Act to, quote, 
assure safe and healthful working conditions for working men and women, unquote. In 1987, the United States Department of Health and Human Services dedicated one of the Cincinnati laboratories of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health to Dr. Hamilton's memory. In 1988, NIOSH initiated the Alice Hamilton Science Award for Occupational Safety and Health to honor excellence in published research in occupational health. Many people in government, labor, business, and academia have contributed much to occupational health during this century, but none with more commitment to science, service, and compassion than Dr. Alice Hamilton.